Good morning. Hello, and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church of Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests. My name is George Shearer, and I'm a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect for the rights and wisdom of indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial history and commit to decolonizing our own practices to learning new ways of being in community in good relationship with the indigenous people of this land and with the land itself. Today's service is led by the Reverend Dr. Omega Burkhart. <laughs> with uh, music director Zaneda Robles. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Families with young children are welcome in either the sanctuary or the narthex. Our family service is on hiatus for the summer and will return in the fall. So bear with me, I have a couple of um, announcements. First of all, uh, Neighborhood Chorus and Neighborhood Bells are looking for new members, and I'm sure that Zaneda would be delighted to talk to you if you're interested. Uh, second thing is that Due to the rain, our refreshments will be held, will be in Coal House after the service. Um, next Saturday, August 26th, we're going to be having a um, sanctuary cleanup. Uh, cleaning our sacred space is a spiritual act, and now's the perfect time as we head into the new church year, starting on September 10th with our annual in-gathering water communion service. So we encourage everyone that can to come and help. Um, to get everything started, pastries and coffee will be provided and then lunch will also be provided. And we're asking that people also bring uh, cleaning materials if that's possible for you. There'll be a sign-up sheet after the service. And finally, after the service next Sunday, there will, the seventh principal committee will be exploring the church's response to our climate emergency. Our order of service and many more announcements are available as a link in your Sunday email, posted in the narthex, or through the QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and other activities at the welcome table. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service.
We gather this morning here in person or perhaps online. We gather this morning with intentionality and excitement, as Carrie Kopnick hints with her words. The things to do have been done, well, for the most part. The people we need are in place, almost. We are ready, or as ready as we will be. We light this chalice this morning to bless this most perfectly imperfect beginning. May we find the right people to do the right things as we go. May we discover that what we needed was right here all along. And may we remember to stop and marvel at the magic of each moment as it floats by. Come, let us worship together. Please rise in body or spirit and join in singing our opening hymn, number 38, Morning Has Broken. Giving is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of its contributions to a local social justice organization or activity. In addition to the plate, online giving is available using the QR code on the donations box just outside the sanctuary or using the text instructions shown on the screen. If you wish to make a payment towards your pledge or contribute to church operations, make a note in the subject line of your check or use an envelope available at the donation box. This week, our gifts go to Friends Indeed. Here to tell us more is Delphine Vasco. Good morning, everybody. Oh, that sounds so nice. Sorry. Um, I'm Delphine Vasco. I'm a member of the Share the Plate Committee, and I'm really excited to talk to you about Friends Indeed this morning. Um, the senior director of programs there, Ryan Greer, shares his apologies for not being here. But as you can imagine, he and his incredible Friends Indeed staff have activated to help our unhoused and at-risk neighbors right now during this storm. 
So I know many in this congregation already know all about Friends Indeed because so many of us have volunteered there over the years. But for those who haven't yet had the opportunity to connect with this wonderful organization, just know that they are an interfaith organization that was started in 1894, and they provide supportive services that meet basic human needs. Some of the services they provide include their food pantry, which serves about 500 families every week. Um, they have a street outreach team, a women's room for women experiencing housing insecurities. They also have, as mentioned before, a weather activated bad welter, bad weather supplies and shelter program. So thank you in advance for your generosity. I'm gonna invite the, uh, the volunteers to come forward and thank you again. When we chose the music for this morning, we didn't know it would be raining. <laughs> Rising green indeed. I'd like to share a reading with you and an invitation to repeat the following phrase with me when I get to the part. The phrase is, this is loving and being loved. This is loving and being loved. Let's say it one more time. That sounded lovely. This is loving and being loved. This is a reading from the Enfleshed Liturgy. To become is a lifelong process. Nothing is constant, not even the self. 
We evolve in the midst of narratives meant only for some and ways of being made narrow by fear and power. We must then have the courage to listen to the truth of our own lives, to the wisdom that comes from within, responding without resistance or need for control, but with welcome and curiosity. This is what ensures our becoming is an unfolding of our truest self. This lifelong labor cannot be carried out alone. It requires help from friends, lovers, family, creaturely, companions, all of those who bear witness to what makes us come alive and to say to us, listen, look, feel, pay attention to that. This is loving and being loved. Telling the stories, sharing the memories, giving thanks for the relationships, understandings and experiences, all of that in the past that has shaped us to this day. This is loving and being loved. Celebrating new beginnings that excite, holding risks together, leaning into unknowns with the promise of support and companionship. This is loving and being loved. Listening to the future, calling uniquely to each of us in the midst of all of life's noise, helping one another find our place in the shared labor of collective life supporting each other in what it is that the world is aching and asking from each of us. This is loving and being loved. To say for the first time, this is who I am. This is the truth of my body. This is what I know about myself. This is my name and this is where my path is leading me and to have it heard, to have it received, to have it affirmed, and then to say it again and again as we change and the world changes, and to have each proclamation greeted with an open-armed embrace. This is loved being loved. There is no me without you. We shape one another. The sacred that birthed us weaves our lives together so that we can only find ourselves through shared becoming. For my journey and all of its winding ways, for yours, for all the saints who labored for what is, for all the kin whose lives made ours, possible, for all those yet to come for whom living our truths today will mean breaking possibilities open for them tomorrow. We pause today. We give thanks. We acknowledge that this is loving and being loved. and toys for your delight of birdsong at morning and starshine at night. I will make a palace fit for you and me of green days in forests and blue days at sea. kitchen 
Appropriately dusty, moderately well lit, organized, and utterly fascinating. These are a few of the phrases I would use if I had to describe my first impressions of the attic and the basement <laughs> of the coal house, or is it the neighborhood house? I'm learning. I'm learning. Dusty, appropriately. Lit, organized. Mm -hmm. I will admit it was at the prodding of my colleague and friend, the Reverend Dr. Nicole Kirk, a theologian and historian who was visiting Pasadena last week. It was at her urging, she convinced me to ask Elizabeth Campo, our executive director, where are the archives? are stored. <laughs> you see, well, I had hoped eventually to get elbows deep in the archives, I was a little nervous. I was feeling a little shy, perhaps, of poking around too soon, tentative of asking this church building, buildings, to share their secrets with me. Maybe we need to build a little trust, the buildings and I, so they could learn that I will be a good steward of those stories, even while I learn how to be that good steward. I found the archives. I didn't quite delve in. I asked permission of the space, gently opening a few of the protective boxes to peer inside blowing off the dust of some of the framed portraits of ministers of the earliest church years, noting what has been lovingly stored by this congregation, honored by you, honored how you celebrated and have questioned your complex and beautiful history. Make no mistakes, I will be delving into those archives at some point, and I count on you, I ask for your help in teaching me, together, how we live into the mission that we are setting out to achieve together for our shared future. You and I are perched on the beginning of what we hope will be a long path together. But make no mistake, it is not your beginning, nor is it my own, 
Rather, my beginning with you and yours with me, our shared beginning. It's not hard to speak in metaphor when we talk about beginnings, cleansing rain for the day. There is time to end and a time to begin, a time to plant and a time to reap what has been planted. For the past three years or so, this community has gone through a process that defines our faith as Unitarian Universalists, that of deciding what community, what kind of church you want to be, how you want to be in a world increasingly marked by a catas- uh, ca- catastrophe, excuse me, and political strife, marked by pandemic, and a new understanding of what is mutual care, resilience, and vulnerability. You have taken the lead from your interim minister, my friend and colleague, the Reverend Teresa Cooley, to whom I send gratitude daily for her care of this church during the pandemic. And I know you have been served by other beloved ministers whose love for you I also honor today. I begin my time with you knowing that you have put in that work, the sacred and complicated and tremendously rewarding heart work into making this community stronger. I know this, that I am joining you on your path, but not at the beginning of your path. You have crafted new ways to approach governance. You have uncovered and worked towards reconciliation and reparations for hard truths of your past. You have visioned and reimagined all of the ways you could be more accountable to the community that community that resides within these walls, the region, and also the world. You have celebrated your ancestors. Some members of this community have joined the ancestors in this time. You imagine how your descendants will live in this world as Unitarian Universalists because babies continue to be born. Years of spiritual growth and work that coincided with a global catastrophe. So I invite you in this moment to pause. We'll hold a moment of silence as we listen to the rain fall on this lovely building. I invite you to consider August of 2020, three years ago. Where does that reside in your body? What memories come to mind? How have you changed? How has this world changed? I invite you to sit with that for a moment, breathing deeply, holding those memories, those feelings, cherishing them for just a moment. Centering those feelings, exhale, inhale, exhale, Open your eyes, feel yourself in this space, grounded into this moment, this moment of rain, this moment of beginning together.
Now, another unfolding, a major unfolding has happened in the world these past three years. One that has also had an effect on our culture and understanding of ourselves. On August 14th of 2020, the first episode of the television show Ted Lasso aired. <laughs> I take it you didn't expect me to go there with, <laughs> with that. There are three seasons of the show. The finale aired earlier this summer, and I promise I won't give any spoilers. Well, I won't give all the spoilers, but I do recommend you watch it if you haven't done so, because I suspect it will show up in a sermon or two. <laughs> this year. For those of you who have not watched the show, Ted, Coach Lasso, is a salt-of-the-earth football coach from Kansas. He accepts a position as the managing head coach for a soccer football team in England. He knows nothing about soccer and actually admits later in a press conference out loud that what he doesn't know about the sport could fill up two internets. <laughs> coach Lasso is accompanied by his friend and assistant, Coach Beard. Coach Beard is an enigmatic and rightfully named bearded, silent philosopher. Coach Beard is the one who reads the manuals, he learns the history of the game, although he really only seems to offer his opinion when he's asked directly. However, as the seasons progress, we learn how vital Coach Beard is to the success of the whole team, over his funny glasses, for those of you who have seen it. The entire show is three seasons long. And without giving away the climax or the resolution that ties everything together towards the end, I think it's possible to say that the success of the team in the show and the show itself, if we can break that fourth wall, is due in part to the growth of each character individually, as well as the development of a team ethic. A covenant, if you will, guided by ethical decisions, mutual care, respect, and acknowledgement and appreciation for difference, as well as shared, exciting vision for the future. I think the show is a master class in creating a space where individuals are encouraged to grow in the way that is best for them, but also in accountable relationship to the whole system that is in turn also an example of interdependence and coordinated visioning. It is a beloved community, if you will. It extends beyond the office that the coaches share into the locker room into the building and the offices where the staff work, into the local pub, into the town, into the region, and even to his family that still live in the United States. Because of these tender and often quite funny lessons of the show Ted Lasso and its culmination earlier this summer, when I was preparing for my first sermon with you today, I thought I would mine the show for some deep theological truths. Why not? We are a living tradition for some deep theological truths that maybe show up in the first few episodes some sort of foreshadowing, some indicators of the complexity and the growth that the show eventually unravels. I was looking for trumpets and fanfare because I honestly didn't remember the first few episodes. I was looking for some fireworks, some universe, excuse me, universal truths about beginnings 
for shared journeys. And I found some. I found three that I'd like to talk with you about today. The first one, Coach Lasso utters this phrase, and it serves as a good reminder that our journeys may look easy in retrospect, but it's the doing of the journey itself that can be quite complex. And this is where you're gonna learn that I also lived in Kansas for part of my life. <laughs> <clears throat> and occasionally that accent still resides within me. <laughs> Coach Lasso says, hey, taking on a challenge is a lot like riding a horse. If you're comfortable while you're doing it, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> There's a little theology in that. <laughs> Of course, we never want to assume that everyone here is an equestrian, <laughs> number one. But I don't want to ever suggest that folks be uncomfortable in church. But what I think these words can suggest for us is that intentionality and practice is important in how and why we gather. It's not an accident that we are here together. We don't all serendipitously or accidentally show up for a Sunday morning worship or a board meeting or a pastoral care meeting. We don't create beloved community by chance or happenstance, but with love at the center of what we do, whether that's conflict resolution or creating a mission statement or deciding who puts out the coffee all important work in a community. Beginning something is not easy. We have to overcome the inertia of doing nothing. And then comes the real challenge of living into, of intentionally crafting how that beginning will become practice. I am reminded of the quote, how you do anything is how you do everything. Now this quote is attributed to Martha Beck, but I have heard countless variations of it. I'm sure you have as well. In other words, how we are together intentionally in the small ways is how we are with ourselves and the world. This is not to say that we won't make errors and we will need to extend grace both to ourselves and to others. We intentionally face these challenges, though, with form, with learning every day how to have more stamina and strength and finesse, and always with a dash or two of joy. Now, the second hint at the universal truths surrounding the beginnings in Ted Lasso the second hint appears in a small poster that Coach Beard hangs above his desk on their first day in office. It becomes important for several characters' development throughout the show. The poster that he hangs up, and I don't have an image here, but we can imagine it, it is the Pyramid of Success, created by a famed basketball coach, John Wooden. Some of you may have heard of him. I hear he coached a little team <laughs> out here in California. His pyramid consists of a top box with a pyramid of foundational boxes below. The top box says, competitive greatness. Perform at your best when your best is required, and your best is required each day. On the bottom, forming the widest part of the pyramid are the, fo the following foundational blocks. Industriousness, success travels in the company of very hard work. There is no trick, no easy way. Then next to it, friendship, strive to build a team filled with camaraderie and respect, comrades in arms. Next to it, loyalty, be true to yourself. Be true to those you lead. Next, cooperation. Have utmost concern for what's right, 
rather than who's right. And last, enthusiasm. Your energy and enjoyment, drive and dedication will stimulate and greatly inspire others. Now, I will be the first to admit that what I don't know about coaching, basketball, soccer, or football, would also fill up two internets. <laughs> but I do know a thing or two about churches and the way we build beloved community. And gosh, those pyramid pieces sound a lot like how we create and nurture ourselves and each other. Certainly, we understand that success is measured differently in the sporting world than it is here. This is not a competition. Church is not a competition. However, healthy relationships and mutual care are fundamental to our faith formation path. And because of that, I think that that pyramid holds true for us. We can't be successful. We can't start at the top of the pyramid. In fact, there's no success in a church without that foundational level of right relationship with yourself, with your leaders, with your staff, and fellow congregants. A team of camaraderie and respect, all of us included, being true to ourselves and to others, having concern and acting on it having energy and excitement about what we will learn and what we will create together. This is how we will create sacred community, with love at the center of all of those actions. Now, we will, you and I, independently and maybe together, we will err, we will make errors, and we will intentionally and purposefully work towards reconciliation to rebuild trust. We will foster a sense of wonder and excitement, I hope, at our own lifelong and group faith formation. And while we do so, we will support others in that path, including those who have not yet joined us. We begin that journey together now. Now, the third theological point that I learned while re-watching the beginning of Ted Lasso is this. The weight of expectation can spoil the unfolding. You see, when I went back to watch the first few episodes, I had already seen the whole series. So when I went back to watch the first few episodes, I assumed I would see all sorts of fireworks and trumpets and fanfare indicators of how the show would unfold, and I was surprised when I didn't see them. That's because the weight of my expectation, the weight actually interfered, interfered with just the enjoyment of beginning again. Coach Lasso's team doesn't yet trust him, though they are curious about him. The fans in the town where he lives are extremely skeptical about his ability, save a few fellows in the local pub who are excited for his arrival. I think they're excited at most things, which is great. <laughs> the press largely hounds him, save for a writer or two who does him the honor of asking a solid question or two. But what we can see in those budding relationships, in those very first interactions, is a willingness to be vulnerable with each other. The coaches with each other, with the teammates, the teammates with the coaches, people of the town. A desire to learn more about each other, an ability that to recognize that no one is the expert on everything, and an honest curiosity for how they can learn from each other. So I ask you, can we set aside the weight of our expectations to live into the experience of beginning 
this process together? I think so. The fanfare of a new beginning may be important. And we'll talk in about five years about whether or not a hurricane on the first day I preach meant anything. <laughs> I, I will confess, I mentioned to my husband earlier, I said, I don't know, I talk about beginnings, and here we have this hurricane, and he was so loving to me, he said, a hurricane is not fanfare. And I went, right, a hurricane is not fanfare. <laughs> I almost rewrote that section. <laughs> the fanfare of how we begin together, how we become together, is the real work. After the fanfare, begins the process, the sacred and intentional actions of continued learning, of accountability, of collaboration, of faith formation, trust building, putting love in the center of all of those actions. That is how we will begin to travel on this path together, and this is how we will become together how we will become. So the next time, and there will be a next time, the next time I venture into the attic to take out an archival box from the shelf and I open it, I will have a deeper understanding of how the story contained in those yellowing pages, how it intertwines with ours how it forms the tapestry into which our stories that we create, that we create into being, how those will be woven in. Just as I also know that at some point in the future, others will look to us to see how we navigated this moment together, our beginning and then our becoming. What I hope that they will find and what I ask for your partnership in is that the beginning of our story, our shared story, our becoming together is marked by intentionality, vulnerability, wonder, and enthusiasm for what we might build together. Because after all, this is loving and being loved. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit and join us in singing together hymn 131, Love Will Guide Us.
to echo the words from earlier, there is no me without you. We shape one another, the sacred that bird thus weaves our lives together so that we can find ourselves through shared becoming. For my journey and all its winding ways and for yours, for all the saints who labored for what is, all the kin whose lives made ours possible. For all those yet to come for whom living our truths today will mean breaking possibilities open for them tomorrow, we extinguish this chalice in gratitude for what has been, in acknowledgement for what is, and for excitement for what will be. <laughs>